Well, I want to thank John for what I think is the most fulsome and frankly intimidating introduction I've ever had. Um, being told that I'm following in the footsteps of Stanley Reed 70 years ago to the day, Robert Jackson 60 years ago, and Thurgood Marshall 50 years ago was about to make me faint dead over. But I'll, and then being told that I'm incredibly eloquent, et cetera, et cetera, is setting the bar pretty high. I hope I won't disappoint people. I can't tell you how thrilled Debbie and I have been to be here and to enjoy, quote, everything Chautauqua has to offer, which is itself a pretty intimidating task. I want to offer some observations this afternoon about the difficult choices that terrorism presents to one particular government institution, our courts. When the government chooses to prosecute suspected terrorists criminally, the courts do very well. And indeed, prior to 9-11, suspected terrorists in the United States were restrained and punished almost exclusively through criminal proceedings. When courts enforce those rules, they don't need to call upon reserves of institutional credibility to legitimize what they're doing, to legitimate their authority. The political branches of government and all of us in the public are familiar with the role of courts in this regard, and we all honor the judicial actions that follow established law, even if in our opinion we might have ruled differently had we been the judge. And in these criminal cases, the role of the political branches is also clear. Congress writes the criminal law, and the executive prosecutes those who break it. And yet, when confronting terrorism, the stability of the criminal process comes with special limitations. Criminal laws and procedures may suffice to punish terrorists after the fact, but they might impede and at least they sometimes appear to impede, the important goals of preventing terrorist acts from occurring, and relatedly, from obtaining information from those who haven't yet committed a crime about, about terrorist acts that might occur. And much the same is true with when the government acts to deport an alien who is suspected of promoting terrorism. He or she is out of our country, but they aren't necessarily out of our care. They probably aren't even detained anywhere. And so the alternative for government, of course, is to treat terrorism as a form of war. And here, at least, the appropriate role of the courts is, to say the very least, not well defined. When Congress and the President are aligned, and appear to agree that a particular wartime measure is necessary, American courts, including our Supreme Court, have rarely stood in the way. Just consider the forced relocation of Fred Korematsu and other loyal Japanese Americans during World War II. As for the other function of courts, maintaining the separation of powers, Courts sometimes do effectively mediate when one of the political branches, and it's usually the president, has apparently overstepped the bounds of its wartime authority. The classic case in our constitutional history is Youngstown Sheet and Tube versus Sawyer, in which the Supreme Court rejected President Truman's attempt during the Korean War to seize control over the nation's steel mill which were threatened with a strike. And the court held that only Congress could authorize an emergency measure of this sort. Justice Jackson's concurring opinion in that case is the preeminent articulation of the president's wartime authority vis-a-vis -vis Congress. And it is an opinion that is very much on the minds of jurists and lawyers throughout the government today. Even when the war is a conventional one, and even when those detained are formally enemy soldiers or nationals, ex parte querying, in which the Supreme Court affirmed the military convictions of eight Nazi soldiers who infiltrated the United States, 
In that case, Justice Jackson, who was newly on the court, circulated an unpublished opinion for his colleagues, in which he reminded them, quote, that the field they are, en they are entering is as novel to experienced judges as to new ones. Now, the Supreme Court in Quirin did uphold the detention, trial, conviction, and execution of the eight German soldiers. It was a difficult case, but in hindsight, it seemed so easy. Everyone knew that World War II was going to end. The defendants were soldiers of an enemy state, a state with which we were formerly at war. They took off their uniforms only after they had landed on the beach at Amagansett, Long Island. They were charged with and convicted of specific war crimes. The present circumstances add several layers of complexity and perplexity to the issues that the court confronted in query. We are detaining indefinitely, without charge, citizens of nations with whom we are at peace, often apprehended far from anything that could meaningfully be called a war zone. So in what sense are these enemy combatants? In what sense is, for judicial purposes, is this the adjudication of the acts occurring during a war? Well, Let's look at how our Supreme Court has addressed cases involving these detainees and what lies ahead. One of the first post-9-11 cases involved an American citizen named Yasser Hamdi. Now, the plurality opinion, the opinion that controlled the outcome, was written by Justice O'Connor, Chautauqua's own Justice O'Connor. And her opinion governed the result. Writing for four justices, she held she thought that the authorization for the use of military force generously could be read as authorizing the detention of Hamdi, who after all was captured with Taliban forces in Afghanistan. But she held that he could be detained only if the government provided him adequate procedural protections to ensure that he and others like him really were enemy combatants. Her opinion adopted a balancing test to flesh out the nature of the required protections, which it said included access to a neutral decision maker, a meaningful opportunity to rebut the military's charges, and, at least in Hamdi's case, the right to a lawyer. And yet many read Justice O'Connor's plurality statement that, quote, War is not a blank check for the president regarding detention. As an important, even if limited, statement by the court about civil liberties in war.